Good morning. How are we doing today, people? We good? We good? Um, what an awesome song. Amen? That's a good song. Hey, um, is anybody dealing with sickness in their family right now? It's crazy, man. But what I wanted, wanted you to realize is that these guys up here, Gary's sick. We've got others that's been dealing with sickness. And, um, man, we ought to just give it up for them and thank them for, um, for being here and, and uh, leading us in worship every week. They do an incredible job. Uh, today we are starting in a series, as you can see, called LOL. Anybody ever seen that before? I mean, anybody that's texted for any amount of time, you use that every day. You text it yourself. You receive text, LOL. And it's, it's an acronym that is commonly used for what phrase? Right, laugh out loud. If someone texts you something funny, you send back what? LOL. But what I've noticed, be honest, have you ever put LOL as a sympathy laugh? Come on. It, like one of them. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. The sympathy laugh where it really wasn't all that funny, but you just decided you was going to send it just not to, you know, hurt their feelings. Or how about this one? Have you, ever, have you ever put it at the end of something that you sent that you were really serious about, but you didn't want them to know that you were really serious about it? You know the passive-aggressive text? You know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you think if you put LOL at the end of something serious, that it makes it all better, Right? All right, but LOL is one of those commonly, uh, probably the most commonly used acronyms in the texting world or in the, the, the uh, media world, but, but come to find out there's more than one meaning. I don't know if you realize that or not, but there's a bunch of meaning, meanings to LOL. In fact, I found 80 different phrases, and we're going to go through all of them this morning. I'm just kidding, but maybe a few you've heard, like lots of laughs. Anybody heard that one? Lots of luck. You heard that one? I've heard that one. How about Lord of Lies? That sounds like a description of Satan. <laughs> Live out loud. Live out loud. I've heard that one. How about this one? I've never heard this one before, but I am going to use it at some point. Lots of llamas. <laughs> For real. I, 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 I'm going to use it sometime. Love our Lord is one. I like that one. Love our Lord. How about this one? Lots of lust. Yeah, that's when text gets real awkward when you text your mom. Yeah, it gets awkward. <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of like you, that's the one that you send and you say, LOL. <laughs> and you send an emoji licking their lips. That's what you do. That's what you do on that one. But it gets awkward. It's going to make you think twice now when you send LOL to people. I'm just saying. What's bad is this. This is what happens. What's bad is when you don't understand that there's other meanings to LOL, and you send it out thinking it means one thing, and the other person thinks it means something completely different. Jordy told me about a story. There was a post on Facebook one time where someone posted a very serious thing. They posted a prayer request praying for their family because they had lost a loved one. There was a few replies there like, praying for you, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, if you need me, I just want you to know I'm going to be there. And if you scroll down a little bit further, you see LOL. And either they were referring to the other popular phrase of lots of love or wow, you are one mean person. That's for sure. But if, 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 if you don't understand the meaning, it can get confusing. And if you've done that before, listen, we're just kidding around. It's no big deal. We know what you meant, lots of loves. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Not only is there meanings in the texting world, did you know they have LOL surprise dolls out now? Anybody with girls, little girls, you know what I'm talking about, them stupid little surprise things that you have to unwrap like 15 times to finally get to the doll. But LOL is so commonly used now, and it has so many different meanings. Who can really keep track? So for us during this series, why are we doing this? During this series, I want LOL to have a whole new meaning. That when we look at it, when we send it, when somebody sends it to us, that we think about this every time we see it. Love out loud. That's our new series. Not LOL, but love out loud. That God has called the church, has called us to love out loud. 
Now, here's the thing. We've talked about love quite a bit the last few weeks as we've been in, uh, when we were in the red letter new year. And one of the repeating themes that we kept saying throughout that series was what? Love is the... Okay, a few people remember it. Love is the main thing. When Jesus was asked, Jesus, what is the greatest command of all the commands? What did he say? Love. He said, love God and love others. Jesus also told his disciples, he said, a new command I give you, not new as they had never heard it before, but a new command as this is, this is, I want to refresh this for you. I want you to make sure this is what drives you and motivates you. He says what? This is the command to love who? Love one another, to love your neighbor. In scripture, over and over and over again, we are called to love and we are called to love God and we're called to love each other. And so we've been talking about this, even the last series, and so why, Caleb, would you talk about love again already? And here's why. I think most of us in this room, even Christian or not, most of us in this room understand the call to love. We understand the call, but I think that we don't quite understand the kind of love that we are called to show. And so as I was thinking about this series, it hit me. Love is kind of like LOL, the acronym. Love has so many different meanings in our world. Depending on your environment, where you grew up, your atmosphere, how you were brought up, it it shapes, doesn't it? It shapes our definition of love. Love is so overused in the English language. I mean, we don't know if we, we love God the same as we love pizza. We love everything, right? We start equating our love for things, our love for people, and equate it with our love toward God. And to be quite honest with you, it gets kind of fuzzy. It gets blurry. It gets confusing. And here's what I realized. If we don't understand love, it doesn't matter if we understand we're called to love. If we don't understand love, how can we live love out loud? If we don't understand what kind of love that Jesus commands for us, then how can we ever begin to be obedient? See, our culture over the years has painted a picture through music and through movies and through life, at the very least, an an incomplete view of love. And I would say at the very end of the spectrum, our culture has, uh, has painted a completely inaccurate picture of love. And so let me tell you what I hope happens through this series and what I've been praying for. I pray that God will show us through his word and through the revelation of his Holy Spirit that he will show us the kind of love he's called us to and that we will tangibly learn how to start living love out loud. So let's pray and ask for that. Heavenly Father, God, we, God, we thank you so much for your son Jesus, your outpouring of love to us. And God, we pray this morning that every single person in this room that, Lord, we will be affected by, that we will be changed by your amazing love for us. God, teach us what it means to love you and teach us, God, what it means, what kind of love we're supposed to show the people around us. And God, show us throughout this series what it means tangibly in our life, how to live love out loud. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, like the beginning of any series, we try to lay a foundation. We want to get ready to kind of build on it for several weeks. And we're going to be looking in 1 John chapter 4 today. And there's a good chance we're going to be back in this uh, this book. Uh, And we're going to get there in just a moment. But let me give you just a little bit of background here. Tradition says that the Apostle John is the one that wrote this letter. But I always wondered, I don't disagree with that, but I've always wondered, who is that letter specifically to? Was it specifically to a certain group? We know this, it was definitely to the church. It was definitely to people that were followers of Jesus. But my question always is, was there a church that was there at that time that it was actually intended for? There's some things that we can find out by reading 1 John. One of these things is this. Uh, we, we see that whoever he's speaking to, he warns them over and over about false doctrine. Over and over, he warns them about false teachers and false, false apostles. And then he speaks a lot about love. And so that's why we're going to be in that book. 
But, but after doing a little bit of research, again, I'm thinking, man, I want to know who this audience is, who he's speaking to. What I find out is that most sources say that, that he actually, John, lived in Ephesus for a while, that he'd built a relationship with the people. And even though we're not sure of this, I'm telling you now, this is not uh, the, the Bible saying this, but because but, we're not sure, but it seems plausible then that John was writing a letter to the fellow believers and Christians inside of Ephesus. Well, Caleb, why does this matter? This is boring. Why does this matter? Do you know another book that Jesus told John to write? We read it a little bit last week. It's at the end of the Bible. Does anybody know what book that is? Revelation. Well, what I found out is, is there's seven letters, right, that were written to seven physical churches, and, and, and we read part of the letter that was written to the Ephesians last week. And so as I was reading through 1 John, it hit me that there are repeating themes in 1 John and repeating themes in Revelation about Ephesians, about Ephesus. And so look at it, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Revelation 2, verse 2. Jesus says this, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have, here's the repeating theme. I've already mentioned what we see in 1 John. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. There was some false teaching, some false doctrine that were going, was going on in Ephesus. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now look at verse 4. We read this one last week. Yet I hold this against you, Ephesians. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. You have forsaken your first love. Another repeating theme that you see in 1 John as he's going to teach, we're going to see about love. Jesus says this. Man, y'all have done some great things. Y'all have worked hard. You, you've stayed away from false teaching. You, you mentally know what is right and wrong. You know the things that you should do. But he says this, I hold one thing against you. You have forgotten, no more than forgotten. You've abandoned. You have laid down the main thing. And the main thing is what? Love. What he says is, you're doing all these great things and all these acts of service, but, but your motivation, your driving force behind of all these things is no longer love. But here's what I got to thinking about. If I was a betting man, and I'm not, but if I was, I would almost guarantee you that if those followers in Ephesus were asked this question, why do you do what you do? Why are you doing all these great things? Why are you doing these acts of services? What is it all about? I can almost guarantee you with 99% certainty that they would say something like this. We do it in the name of love. We're doing it in the name of love. We serve because of love, but yet love is what they were struggling with. Now let me ask you, how often do we hear this in our culture today? We do what we do in the name of love. I think about uh, the 60s and 70s, and just in case you were wondering, no, I was not around during that time. But during the 60s and 70s, there was a popular slogan that went around. I wonder if anybody remembered it. Make, not, make love, not war. Now, of course, it began as a protest to the Vietnam War, and it began as a protest really to war in general, but it was so much more than that. This was the beginning of the anything goes revolution. It was you do what you want to do. It was the sexual revolution that was taking place. The rise of pornography in America, man, just skyrocketed, which has been a great thing for America, right? No, it's just broken relationships and destroyed uh, faithfulness and relationships. Not only was the, the rise of pornography going on, but there was an unprecedented time of sexual openness, of just do what you want to do, the exploration of sex. And get this, it was all done in the name of love. Now let's fast forward a few years to our present. Not much has changed. Do you realize that? Decisions in our country and around our world right now are being made in the name of love. It's being made in the name of love. And this is what's happening. It's polluting and it's confusing the minds of people and even the minds of people in the church on what love truly is. People all around us is living their definition of what love is. 
And here's the thing. Those people are living it, not quietly. They're living it out loud. They're screaming it from the rooftops. They want everyone to hear and everyone to know their misunderstood definition of love. And I'm going to tell you, church, the only way we can combat that is we, if we start screaming it and start living it louder than the others. And we start, we start screaming and living the, the, out loud the real love, love that's divine by God himself. Think about this for a moment. We have an enemy. Do you realize that? And let me tell you what the goal of the enemy is. His goal is this. He wants to distort everything that God says is good. He don't want to just take it away. He wants to distort it. He wants to confuse us. And so if Jesus says that true love is the main thing, which he does over and over again, what better way do you think could get us off track than to distort and water down the very definition of the main thing, love? So let's look now. You didn't think I was going to get there. Look at 1 John chapter 4, now that we've got some background. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. And here's what I want you to remember as we read this. We don't know this for sure, but I think it's possible that he could be writing to the church in Ephesians, or at least a church that's struggling with being motivated by love. So let's keep that in mind. Verse 7. Dear friends... Let us love one another, for love comes from who? Love comes from God. It is poured out from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because, say that next phrase. Because God is love. He doesn't only pour it out, but he is love. The very essence of him. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Look at verse 10. We want to know what love is. Here it is. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Look at verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Or another version would say, his love is made perfect in us. And what that means is this, we can't see God, but if we're expressing God's love in front of people, all of a sudden they can see who God is and know his love. Verse 16, and so we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. Say that phrase with me one more time. God is is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, we love like Jesus. See, a couple times in this passage, we see this one statement. God is what? God is love. He doesn't just pour it out. He is the very embodiment of love. His very nature and his being is love. God does not just merely love. He is love itself. Everything God does flows from his very being, which is love. But here's what blows my mind about this passage. I mean, it blows my mind. God commands and calls us, the church, to love him and to love others with the same kind of love. And I'll show you why. In this passage, every time, did we see love a bunch of times in there written out? We did, right? Love, love, love. You see it everywhere. Every single time that we see love, it comes from this very same Greek word. Every time that you see love in this passage, it's from the same Greek word. Whether it's God's love toward us, or whether it's us loving God, or whether it's us loving one another, it all comes down to one Greek word. It is the, the highest form of possible love. And the Greek word, many of you know what it is. The Greek word here is agape. It is used through the entire passage. Now, here's the thing. Y'all know I don't get on Greek words a lot, but, but I, I've got to today because th this could really change your perspective of love. See, there's four different types of degrees of love throughout Scripture. I want you to stay with me. If nothing else, it's fun to hear southern boy pronounce Greek words. Four types of love. The first one is agape. We've already mentioned it. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. 
The, the next one, you have phileo, which, which is a brotherly type of love. It is a love that encompasses loves for, for fellow humans. It's this mutual care, this mutual respect. I respect you. You respect me. It's brotherly love. It could be described as compassion for somebody that's in need. Another type of love, the third one, comes from the Greek word storge. This is like a familial, familial type of love. It's described as a natural love, a love that's innate to humans. It's the love that parents, when you first see your child, when they, when they come out, man, the first time you see them, what happens? You fall in love, don't you? Like immediately. It's this innate familial love. And the last Greek word is the one that was used in the slogan, make love, not war. You know what I'm talking about. It's the word eros. Did y'all hear that son of a boy roll that? Roll that off. I don't even know if it rolls. I just like it. It sounds cool. Everybody say it with me. Eros. Y'all terrible. Anyway, this describes sensual, romantic type love. I'm talking the physical love. It's kind of it's like the love that Marvin Gaye sung about. Let's get it on. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about now. Yeah. You ready? Here it is. Yes, love, Do you hear that? Let's arrows, baby. Let's it's right there. It's right there, man. Man, y'all need to loosen up some of you. Did y'all, did y'all understand now what arrows is? I mean, I can explain it a little further if I need to. Men, don't be going home and say arrows, arrows, arrows. Don't do that to your wives. <laughs> But maybe, maybe, listen, maybe this is why we're so confused on the topic of love. Here we have four different types of love. We have phileo, we have storge, eros, and, and highest level of love, agape. And it's clear in this passage and others that we as the church are called to love God and to love others with an agape type of love. But here's the kicker, y'all. All of these loves, all of these loves can be felt and expressed in our natural selves except one. All of these loves except one can be felt and expressed toward God and even be expressed toward people. Whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, all of them can be expressed except one. You can experience and you can exercise to some degree phileo, you, you can, that brotherly love. You can experience this familial love, that storge, and that sensual love. We know we can all experience eros, but agape, agape. In our humanity, it is unnatural. We can't. We weak. It cannot be expressed in our natural state. Because of our fallen nature, we are incapable of producing agape love on our own. But yet, it's the kind of love that God calls us to pursue and to pour out toward him and to the other people around us. And it can only be done through an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that we can experience and express agape love. Now, I know some of you are sitting there, you're like, now, wait a minute. I'm not a believer. You say, I I don't don't know how to love? No, that's not what I'm saying. I, I didn't say that you couldn't love your wife. That's crazy. I didn't say that you couldn't love your kids or your friends without a relationship with Jesus. I know plenty of people, to be quite honest with you, that might outlove me. You know, they do better expressing it than some of us followers of Jesus. You can, you can express love, but I will tell you this. You and I are unable, incapable to express this supernatural agape love without the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. It is impossible impossible. That's why John says this. Let's look at uh, verse 7 and 8 real quick. First John 7 and 8. He says, everyone who loves, remember agape, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. In other words, it can't be separated. If you love agape, then you know God. And it goes on, whoever does not love does not know God because God is what? Because God is love. See, you and I, we can love to some degree, some degree without Jesus and without the Holy Spirit. Some of it's natural, it's innate, but we cannot even begin to love to the highest degree without Jesus. Let's talk about agape love for a minute, can we? See, agape love is always expressed through action. 
It's not just a feeling that wells up inside of us, that makes us want to move. It, it always, it, it is something that we decide we're going to do, that we're going to love somebody, and it's always expressed through action. It's more than just saying the right things. It always involves doing the right things. The essence, the very essence of agape is goodwill and benevolence. Agape love it involves faithfulness and it involves commitment. It is the act of, of, of the will to some degree. Agape love is love that is sacrificial. In other words, it doesn't seek a benefit on the other end. Agape love is expressed even when the love is not reciprocated back, even when the person completely rejects your love. See, all other love that we've talked about, all other love is more mutual, okay? I'll give you a measure of love, you give me a measure of love back. But agape love, can I tell you, it can be lonely sometimes. In fact, check this out. Agape love is expressed when the other person, quite frankly, they don't deserve it. And the first place we've got to look to begin to understand this agape love is we've got to look back at the source, so let's look at 1 John one more time, chapter 4, verse 9 this time. 1 John 4, 9 says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. I want you to especially pay attention to verse 10. This is love. Well, God, that's what we're trying to figure out. What is love? How do we love? Here it is. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is what I want us to grasp and understand. He didn't send his son because we loved him. Do you know that? Because we pray and we live life as though we, we, we have, he, he sent his son because of us. That he sent his son because we love him. He didn't look down on us and say, wow, man, those people really do love me. Uh, they would do anything for me. He didn't do that, man. He sent his son because he agapeed us. He didn't send his son because we had shown, shown some great love for him, but he sent his son because he loved us. I want you to look at this statement, and it's the only statement I'm going to put on the screen because I want you to remember it. God is more motivated. God is more moved by his love for us than by our love for him. He is more moved by his love, his great love for us, than he is by our love for him. I want you to think about a, a common story. Do you know the story about Mary and Martha and Lazarus? If you've heard that before. Well, see, Mary and Martha, when Lazarus was sick, they decided to write a letter to Jesus. They wanted Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. And it's an odd letter. It's this short, and it's just weird to me. Listen to it. John chapter 11, verse 3. This is the, what was in the letter. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. This is what they said. Lord, the one what? Say that with me. The one you love. The one you love is sick. And when I read that, I thought, that is so strange. I don't know about you, but if I were writing a letter to God about somebody I loved and wanting God to heal them, I would, I would write it or I would pray like this. I would say, God, you know, you know they love you so much. I'd say, he, he loves you so much. God, do you realize all the things he's done and all the things they've sacrificed for you? And it wouldn't be short. I would literally go through a laundry list of great things that he did in the name of love. But what I want you to recognize is this. They knew, they knew what would motivate God the most was not what Lazarus had done for him, not how much Lazarus loved him, but what would motivate God to the core is how much he loved Lazarus. See, when true agape love is shown to people around us, it's the same way. When we show agape love to people, it is not motivated by how much someone else loves us. It's not motivated by what they can give us, but agape love is motivated by how much we choose to love them. Agape love always acts first. And I don't know about you, but too often this is what happens. Too often our love and our goodwill toward other people, what's it motivated by? It's motivated by their love and their goodwill toward us. As long as you treat me right, I'll treat you right. You know, as long as you do this for me, I'll, I'll, I'll match you and I'll do this for you. We love based off of their ability to love us. We love in the same degree as they love us. 
Y'all, I want to tell you something. That may be a type of mutual love. I'm not saying it ain't love. It may be a type of mutual love, but this is not agape love. And I better get an amen because y'all being quiet. Y'all better get an amen right here. Are you glad, anybody glad? Or is anybody glad that God acts from his degree of love for us instead of our degree of love for him? Aren't you glad? We'd be in trouble, man. Because here's the thing. He came yet while we were still what? Sinners, broken, undone. We had nothing to offer up to him, yet he still looked at us and he loved us. In our humanity, check this out. In our humanity, we express love according to the history we have with that person. Don't we? We think back of what's been done to us and, and how they treated us. We, we love based off of the history, and we even love based off of the impending future for them, with them. We think about what could be, and we, we base our love off of that. But I'm going to tell you something. Agape love chooses to express love in the moment, in the here and now. It does not allow the past or, or the thoughts of the future to persuade our love for them now. Turn with me to one more place. One more place, and we're going to finish up. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Matthew 4, 23. This, this, this is crazy, man. I heard, I heard somebody explain it this way, and, um, and it kind of wrecked me. Listen to it. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing... What's that say? Say it again. You, you, that says every. It says healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now think about this for a minute. Really? Jesus, as you walk through, you, you, you healed every. You mean every sickness, every disease. Yes, that's what it says. It doesn't say this. It doesn't say he healed the deserving sick people. It didn't say that he healed the, the good sick people. He said it healed every sick and diseased person. Now, I want you to digest this for a second. See, God has this little thing, I don't know if you've heard of it, called foreknowledge. And what foreknowledge means is he knows everything we're going to do and say before we ever say it and do it. In fact, he knows it before we ever think it. So think about this for a minute. He knows this. He healed hands that he knew would abuse people later. Think about it. He healed eyes that he knew would go off in lust. He healed feet that he knew would run as far away from him as possible. And in my humanity, I want to say, God, what is wrong with you? What are you, what are you doing? You need to utilize your power of foreknowledge maybe a little bit better. I mean, if I was God, if you were God, I know that's scary, right? But if I were God, I would be like, all right, anybody want to get healed? All right, come on, line up. Line up, come on. Oh, you want to be healed? Oh, I bet you do want to be healed. You, you want your, your, your hands to be healed? Is that right? Yeah, yes, sir, I do, I do. Well, here's the problem. I know what you're going to do with those hands later, and so I'm not going to heal you. Run along, little buddy. Next, next. You, you want me to heal those, those eyes? <laughs> I don't think so. I know what you're going to be looking at with those eyes a little bit later. I mean, this is how we process love. This is what we would do. In fact, that's what we do now. We, we give a measure based off of the measure that's brought back to us. We decide who's deserving and who's not deserving. Listen, Jesus heals bad people with bad histories. He heals people who will use the miracle, and he already knows is going to use the miracle maybe to do bad things. And I know what some of us are sitting in this room saying. We're saying, that's not fair. That's not fair. Why would God do that? You better believe, you better be glad that God's not fair. Because if he was fair in this sense, we would have all been rejected. Compared to the goodness and the glory and the holiness of God, we all fail miserably. And we need to get to that point where we know that we fail miserably and that we don't stack up to God. But our God is so gracious and so loving not, that not only will he not inflict your past on your present, but he won't inflict your future on your present either. Agape love loves in the present. It's not dependent on someone's past or what they may do in the future. See, agape love, agape love is sacrificial it's not dependent, again, on the story that you have with them or what they may do. It's not dependent on reciprocating love. And, and it is motivated. It is motivated not by their love or their goodness toward you, but your unconditional love toward them. Agape love 
Agape love, y'all, I'm going to be honest with you, it can be lonely sometimes. Agape love, it is always messy, and agape love is always uncomfortable. It takes you, it steps you out into a zone that you are not comfortable with. But this, this is the very love that God calls, I believe, and commands the church to live out loud. But there's only one way we can do it, and it is only through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want everyone to stand with me for a moment. I'm not going to share much about this story, but I will tell you this. I'm going to be transparent with you. I am in a situation right now, a situation that I am struggling with agape love. It's a situation that, that, that has to do with past things, that I'm having a hard time letting go of those past things. And so I am trying, I, all of us do, man, all of us. There's past things that keep us from loving people the way we should. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, I, I struggle with that too. But the only way we can do it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in just a moment, that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray that, that God, the Almighty God, will give us, enable us to share and to live out loud the love that he's called us to. And I'm going to tell you, agape love, man, is not this easy, fuzzy, warm feeling kind of love. Ooh, it's not like that. Agape love does not make sense to us. Agape love has no human reasoning to it except for this. We love for one simple reason, because God first loved us in this way, and we are to love him and to love others in the same way. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song, Reckless Love. And most of you in here, you know that song. But I'm going to tell you, God's love for us is reckless he, he loves us, man, with a deep kind of love, and we're called to that too. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what your situation. I don't know if you're holding on to past things and it's keeping you from loving someone. I don't know. I don't know. But God does, and you do too. And so this morning as we pray and as we sing, if God speaks to you and you need to lay some of those things down and, and seek God in this area of agape love, then you know the front's always open for you to do that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, so much for your love for us. The only reason, God, that we can have a capacity to love you in any way, shape, or form is because, because of your love that you poured out on the cross for us. And God, some of us right now, we're struggling with some things. We're battling with some things in the area of love. But God, we have got to get this right We've got to realize that love is the main thing. It's the number one thing that you tell us it needs to drive us and needs to motivate us. God, you're motivated by love. And as your followers, we should be too. And so God, maybe some of us, there's some past things that we need to let go. Maybe right now we're struggling with loving somebody, caring for somebody, because we're thinking about what they've done to us in the past. They destroyed our lives. They did this. They did that. God, show us how to love them again. And God, for others of us, see, we don't have foreknowledge, but what we do, Lord, what we do is we think we know what might happen in the future, and so we hold our love back. God, help us to let that go and to live in the moment and to love in the here and now because agape love is ever-present. God, teach us now and teach us throughout this series what the true definition of love is and how to live it out loud. And God, I would say this. I, I can't preach a message like this without offering an opportunity for someone to experience this kind of love. God, it only flows from you. You are love, and, and God, we can't experience it unless we surrender our lives over to you, that we accept your love, and that we start living uh, with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, that we start living in obedience to you. And so, God, maybe there's someone here today that says, you know, I've never been loved. I've never been loved that way. But, God, today you're pouring your love out on them. God, may they just surrender it all to you and say, Jesus, I need you. I repent of my sins, God, and I want to walk in your way with your help. And we'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We love you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Oh, okay. 
thank you for loving us first. Father, we thank you for your grace that pursues us. Father, your grace that chases us when we run from you and that finds us every moment that we turn around. You're there. We don't have to run back to you because you've been chasing us all along. God, thank you for speaking to us this morning, God, for showing us how to love, how to agape. Father, we thank you for your word that you've given us, God, for your voice in our lives. And we thank you for meeting us here this morning, God. Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to go with us as we leave these four walls this week, God, that your spirit would guide our ways, our words, and our hearts as we go out and love as you've called us to, God. Father, we just, we just love you and we thank you for loving us first. We praise your name and give you all the glory for all you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everyone.